Hello everyone, welcome to another Room for Discussion interview. Imagine you have a Venn diagram with the energy transition on one hand and the cost of living crisis on the other hand. What do you have in the middle? Vattenfall. Vattenfall serves two million Dutch customers and is one of the leading energy providers when considering the green transition. They are in highly involved with the energy prices and the transition, topics that we find exceedingly important. Yet, we tend to know very little about where our energy comes from and what is the real impact that it has on changing climate change. So today, let's uh, dive a little bit deeper in the shadows of our day-to-day -day lives and figure out if a blue and yellow logo really equals green business. Uh, I'm Ella, this is Saskia, we'll be your interviewers for the next hour. And now let's please welcome our guest today, uh, the CCO of Vattenfall, Cindy Kroon. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to Room for Discussion. A lot of people don't actually know what your company name means. Could you explain it to us? Yeah, even though you're Swedish, so you know, uh, but Vattenfall, <laughs> it means waterfall in English. And it comes back from our origin a hundred years ago when the Swedish government decided maybe we should use all the water that comes from the mountains and start developing hydropower. So Vattenfall was originated and now we are stuck with it in the Netherlands where Dutch people find it a much more difficult name. Yeah. Of course, yeah. And uh, you already hinted at it, but one thing that separates you from other Dutch energy providers is that Vattenfall Group is 100% owned by the Swedish state. What would you say are the main differences in how a company is run, if it's privately owned or state owned? Yeah, that's the question we get often asked, but I don't feel a difference by being owned by a Swedish state uh, in the sense that they run us and steer us as a private company in that sense. So we are fully business centric, we have to be profitable uh, and like the normal uh, standards apply. I think the difference you sometimes see is that the Swedish state, of course, has some high values at stake, for example, ethnical values, moral values. So in general, you feel that there's more uh, of an interest also in the topic of sustainability. So I consider it a plus. And have there ever been any conflicts between your commercial interests and the Swedish state interests? N no, but I, you do see that there's a difference in where Vattenfall comes from being a state-owned company I think in general, my colleagues in, the, in, in Sweden, they moved away from being part of the government. That was sometimes how uh, citizens in Sweden saw Vattenfall. It, is, it has responsibility to also take care, we will get back to that. If the prices get higher, it's also the responsibility of Vattenfall. It's not, it's a private company, it's a commercial company. In the Netherlands, we're almost taking the opposite route now, where we, and we will get back to that, we decided to take an active stance uh, together with the government or inspiring the government that we should do something about the most vulnerable in the society regarding the high energy prices. So we erected an emergency fund and this in general is something that our Swedish colleagues, well, they're, they're not a big favor of it because this is not a, a task for a private company. Uh, this emergency fund, uh, can you please explain what was the funds that were put into it? Well, there was a combination actually of measures, yeah, and uh, maybe some of you actually, uh, well, most of you probably experienced the increase in your energy bills also yourselves. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that, but can honestly say it was not our doing. Uh, it, it had more of a macroeconomic reason. I think together with the government, we designed last minute, uh, because there wasn't anything else, we, d we designed this price cap mechanism, so everybody was protected above a certain price level. Um, and then still, we felt it wasn't enough. It wasn't as far as we had advised the government to go to support the lower income groups. So we initiated as the top with the three biggest suppliers uh, an emergency fund for those who would still be unable to pay the energy bill. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that's part of a bigger challenge that everything went became more expensive, like the grocery shops, etc. Yeah. Um, that emergency fund was adopted by the government in the end, and now just recently we announced together with the government that we have prolonged it again for 24. Um, and it's quite a success, although a sad success, if you will, because in the first few weeks, already 85,000 households applied for this need, uh, for the help, because they said otherwise we can't afford the bills. And that means they more, that they spend more than 12% of their net income on an energy bill. Mm. 
But so it was partly then uh, money from your company and some other energy companies, and then partly Dutch state money, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And to, to follow all the rules, we had to be, in 2023, it was a 50-50 split, and in 2024, it was a one-third, two-third contribution from the government. Okay, because something interesting here is also, of course, that when uh, Vattenfall would earn money, we would assume somehow it goes towards the Swedish state, because that's the shareholder. Uh, so the when the Dutch state then infuses money into such a subsidy, you know, it makes sense in the local context, but um, it brings the question if Sweden profits from Dutch subsidies. Yeah, that's a complicated story. I won't go into detail there, but that's not what's going on. So, you know, of course, a shareholder uh, uh, earns a certain dividend, a certain pro a profit, uh, like any shareholder. In this case, we made the case from the Dutch uh, uh, situation alone. So the money we put into the emergency fund in one way or another is a compensation for the fact that these people wouldn't have been able to pay the bills. So instead of us you know, charging them or sending them uh, people to collect the money, yeah, with their special agencies for that, instead of doing that, in the Netherlands we say you can't get money from somebody who, you know, who doesn't have any money. I will not say the literal phrasing, which is something with a chicken and feathers. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, instead of making those costs, chasing someone for money they don't have, we decided to invest it elsewhere and together uh, generate a fund with all the other energy suppliers so it's, it's, a sh it's a shift of the money. It's not so necessarily uh, the Swedish state, again, being part of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and generally, it seems that you are, as an energy company, very much involved in the politics of both countries. Do you also see a potential for there to be any conflict of interest between the Dutch and Swedish states? What, what do you mean? Between the political... If there are political tensions between the Dutch and Swedish states, do you think that this would then impact you differently since you are a Swedish uh, company? Well, again, we don't feel that much burden from being a Swedish state-owned company. I understand that the connection is made, but again, the Swedish state is at a distance. They, they uh, run us uh, with a board of directors, which is independent of the state in that sense. Uh, we are run as a private company. So, hypothetically, of course, uh, and we don't... You could argue, is it hypothetical with a war just on, on our front step? Um, I don't think so. Uh, it's a very professionally run company. We have interest in Germany. We'll get to that. Um, I don't think so. On the other hand, uh, the local politics have a very firm influence on the local businesses. Maybe we'll get to that in a second. So right now, what is happening in the Netherlands with the political un in uncertainty? Yeah, we still don't have a formal cabinet. Uh, that is way more impacting me and my business uh, than the Swedish uh, state situation yeah. is. Mm. Yeah, before we get into that, uh, in 2022, you dealt with the Dutch state in another way. The Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets determined that Waterfall Netherlands had many claims on their websites that were misleading to customers. For example, claiming that you were the cheapest wind energy provider. Were there any alarm bells within the company that such claims were greenwashing? I think sort of the, and we had this pre-talk, I think the sad part is that uh, um, the word greenwashing is used. I think in the end that is technically what it was um, or how they ruled, but we decided not to go to court at that point in time. So I don't necessarily, I still don't necessarily agree with what the regulator gave us back. We had a constructive dialogue, we agreed, we didn't agree. And then you have both as regulator and as a company you have options. Will I go to court? Will I fight this? Um, there are two reasons we didn't. Uh, and, and the reason was not because we agreed that we were greenwashing. If we look at the letter of uh, what they uh, accused us of, it was all about p putting the dots on the I in our communication. For example, uh, there were maybe four reasons. One of them was every time you make a claim that you're sustainable, you sh on a website you have to click once and then there should be a full explanation on the next page. We didn't have that always, sometimes you had to click twice. But sometimes you also didn't have the substantive proof for that. For example, being the cheapest wind energy provider. Yeah, and there, for example, this was a, a statement made by our wind colleagues, and they said, you know, we're, we're, our aim is to be the cheapest wind provider. I think it was in the UK. And at that point in time when we were offering, we were that. So it was sort of an ambition or something they were, they were very proud of. And at that point, we couldn't prove it. So there we said, yeah, okay, you're right, because that statement stayed on for too long. It wasn't removed. So we said to the regulator, you're fair, we should have removed it. So, but it was the tiny things in our communication where we said, okay, so yes, you're right, because the rules for communication for energy companies, especially on topics of sustainability, they're getting more firm by the day. Uh, right now, there's new European legislation that, that came into place. The Dutch regulator has said, we will be on the forefront of monitoring this. Sustainability as a word is the new marketing goal. 
and a lot of people are claiming to be green, but that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't add up. Um, and again, so in the end we said, okay, it's, it's minor details, but we agree with the regulator that this, this topic should be handled more carefully. They took us and a competitor who also is very uh, for, on the forefront of becoming more green, and we said, well, we'll take the challenge. We agree, we will perfect it further. Um, and the second reason was, it was on the verge of the energy crisis. So instead of spending our money and our energy into a claim or going to court, I said to them, I have more important stuff to do because there's an energy crisis upcoming. It, we, we could see it coming and we'd much rather talk to you about this. So finally, we decided to agree, we settled and we said, I'd much rather spend the money not to a lawyer in, law, in, in a court, whilst we fundamentally don't agree, but I don't think we should be penalized for it. You could also have given us a tip to improve. Mm -hmm. And then we said, we'll just donate. Here in Amsterdam, we donated a, a substantial amount to a school that put solar panels on their rooftop. We thought that made more sense. So the Sometimes reason, you have to pick your battles. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the reason why uh, they are becoming more stringent in greenwashing, right, is that you see this more and more with companies, energy companies included. And of course, what's so harmful about greenwashing is that it makes it seem like society has gone further when it actually hasn't. So people's expectations are just misled, you know. Um, so in this case, where it is um, a type of marketing strategy, right, it makes you look very good if you have the cheapest wind energy. Uh, however, your value is also to try to be as sustainable as you can be. Don't you see that there would be a big clash between these two? Because no matter what, it was still found to be not quite done in the way it should have been. Yeah, true. Um, so again, we should be very careful in how we communicate. Two opposing com comments could be, if we run a campaign or an advertisement, marketing is all about you know, portraying a picture that people want to belong to. And if, we're, if I'm going to write down the full sentence of what sustainability is, everybody's bored, they will not watch that um, uh, advertisement, and they will not step in. So there's a balancing act. I think the world for the, uh, the, the expertise of marketeers and marketing communication becomes more and more complex, because how do you paint a picture or a description of a company or a product that you want? At the desire, I want that. Whilst on the other hand, you should be really careful what, what it is that you say. Right now, I don't think we have better words for fossil free or sustainability or net zero, but it's the same, that's the challenge the regulator's struggling with, because if I have 20 seconds on TV, just the full definition of sustainability is 20 seconds, and then I haven't sold anything. So that is one, that, that is, that's a complicating one. Um, and, and I think on the other hand, um, we have an ambition that we're proud of, we can substantiate it, and, and you know, we still want to talk about it. Okay. Since the greenwashing scandal, there's been quite a few changes you've made uh, in your messaging and also your sustainability strategy. For example, you are now approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Could you briefly... We were already, whilst the greenwashing deal was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but could you briefly run us through your main points of your roadmap to the net zero? Yeah, and, and thanks for mentioning SBTI, but this is, one, this is still a very unknown target, which is fair, because just science-based target initiative as a word is complex, and then the measurements behind it are very complex. We thought it was really important to have an independent authority to approve our roadmap and also be able to track us on it. So we were very proud that we were one of the first European energy companies that got their roadmap approved. Um, uh, and that, that is checking our ambition towards 2030 and 2040. So Vattenfall's ambition as a European energy company is that we want to uh, reduce our uh, CO2 emissions with more than 55% compared to the reference year 2017 and with more than 90% in 2040. And thereby our aim is at that point in time to become net zero, which basically means that the remaining part you then still have, you have to compensate for it in any way. That's still to be discussed, yeah, how, to, how to fill that in. Uh, so that's quite a, quite a strong ambition. Mm. And one big problem for Vattenfall uh, with that ambition, of course, is that you're still partly reliant on fossil fuels. Um, how much of the energy that you currently sell in the Netherlands comes from fossil fuels, if you know a rough estimate? Yeah, for our B2C customers, so households and SME, zero. So okay. All the energy we, we sell to our households and SME customers since two years is 100% Dutch green electricity. So we're really proud of that. Um, um, but sorry, for, our B for, yeah? the, for the businesses you sell to? Yeah, exactly. The B2B customers, I was about to get there. For the B2B customers, it's right now is roughly 48%. But uh, uh, quickly rising, mm -hmm. there we cannot source everything from Dutch electricity, so we are also looking at European GOOs. Uh, so totally for the group in the Netherlands, it's like 62%. 
And we're pretty proud of that because when I joined, uh, well, I didn't join, when I was, uh, when I became responsible for the commercial part of uh, Vatovo at that point, a new one, we only sold like 4% of uh, green electricity to co consumers in the Netherlands because the reasoning was nobody is asking for it or they're not willing to pay the additional price. So to get from that point in time was 2015 to 100% right now, that made us a bit proud. And what are those uh, green sources that you mentioned and what are the sources of fossil fuels that are most commonly used? So generally speaking in the Netherlands, um, I would say let's first start with Vattenfall Europe. Huh? So we're very big, as you know, in hydro. So roughly 36% is, it comes from hydropower. Unfortunately, in the Netherlands, we don't have these big hills and big water streams. We do have two small hydropower plants in the Netherlands. We're very proud of them <laughs> in Maurik and Alfa and the Maas. Uh, but they're only like 10 megawatts each. So they're really small, but I always mention them because we're proud of them. Mm -hmm. But so hydropower in the general mix is really big. And then we have nuclear. Interesting topic in the Netherlands, um, because as you know, in Sweden, nuclear is very adopted and very accepted, also in France. 36, 37% in, in, in the group therefore comes from uh, nuclear. Then we have like wind for about 15% and the remaining part, and we have some biomass, uh, especially in Sweden again, uh, and then we have the remaining part fossil. Uh, the fossil uh, is still in Germany, of our core countries and in the Netherlands. We have closed our last coal-fired power plant in the Netherlands, as you uh, very close by might remember on the Hemweg. 2019, so, right? Yeah, exactly. So we don't run a coal-fired power, coal power plant anymore. So the Netherlands, our mix generally is uh, comprises of natural gas, but uh, on the side also wind and solar, and that part will increase, as well as biomass and waste. So, but mostly gas then, in terms of the Netherlands, fossil fuels? Uh, oh, and wind and solar are becoming really big because, as you know, we have opened our uh, first uh, uh, subsidy-free offshore wind farm, Hollands Kust Zuid, that we're very proud of, 139 turbines uh, uh, offshore. Um, and th that's good for like one and a half million households if we just take the production of that site. So it is growing and we are investing and uh, there are some new tenders coming up that we are hoping to bid on and, and win. Uh, but that, that percentage is vastly growing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, on your website, I think you also mentioned green gas, right? Yeah. So, what makes gas green? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, that's a, that we can talk for an hour about that. I learned everything about cows. Well, if you're in the Netherlands, you know a lot about cows, but you know the production of cows apart from milk comes from another uh, exit point. Um, <laughs> so, there's a lot of mono-digesting going on, um, especially in France, we see that biomethane, bio that's actually the, the right word for green gas, is quite a big market. So, we're trying to uh, use that world of mono-digestion um, and, and we're going to, uh, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a chemical process that basically then produces green gas, natural, not from the ground, but a, a clean, CO2 emission-free green gas. And that is something we expect to be covering for a third of the heat uh, requ requirements from the Netherlands, because we have heat pumps as a good alternative for natural gas. We have district heating mm -hmm. uh, that we're building also here in Amsterdam with some other challenges, and, but it's still a third given the high density uh, uh, or, or historical uh, cities, but also rural areas. We believe green gas is the substitute for natural gas. So uh, we tried to research all of these makeups of your energy portfolio uh, for this interview, but we found it very difficult to find any recent data on this. Is this public information? It is public information and our new, uh, it's called the Strome etiquette, so the power mix uh, uh, label. That is public information and the new label will pop up uh, any minute. Because we, we report on that over the previous year, so you were just probably a bit uh, early. But I can send the label of 22 to you in hindsight, so you can check what it said. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and is it also a priority for you to make this more accessible? Since also the ones for the previous years were not that accessible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it definitely is. And, and not only because we're proud to report on our results, it's because finally, I would say, people are more interested in it. I, I used to have the most boring job in my friend group because they always said, you work for an energy company? Why? Are you still with an energy company? What's exciting about that? Isn't it more fun to work at Unilever or Coca-Cola? Um, now but nobody asks me that question anymore. Uh, so there's a lot of people now more interested in the data, and now of course we have to see where to put it and how to make it understandable and explainable. But the information definitely is there, so I'll send you the click through the click uh, route. Um, and apart from that, there's also there new legislation coming up. So we have the CSRD, uh, the, the new standard on reporting that is really promoting bigger companies to open up about what is it that you're doing, but also open up where do you still find issues, what, what's more, what's complicating. 
Um, so also there, this opening up process, I don't think it's necessarily that we were hiding it. It's more like to make it understandable, eh, as the discussion mm -hmm. we had, and to fully understand the complexity of the whole package. Uh, again, that's, that's, that was quite challenging. So you, you mentioned this already, but your energy mix, of course, also changes depending on which country or area we're talking about. Um, in the Netherlands, what would you say is the most high potential source of sustainable energy? Renewable, that is. Well, we, we strongly believe uh, in wind. Uh, so it's a big a key investment for Vattenfall. Just to give you a picture, we have like a 7.7 .7 billion euro investment plan just for 23 and 24 euros, billion euros. Uh, we always have to convert from SEC to, to euros. <laughs> Fair. Um, but of this 7.7 .7 billion euros, it's like 65% of that investment plan is growth. Mm -hmm. And of that, 35% for the Netherlands. And of that, the majority in wind. So if you do the math really yeah. quickly, Big or look this back, it's like 2 billion euros just in two years' time in building these uh, both onshore and offshore wind, uh, yeah, wind farms. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, we invest in e-boilers, uh, very close by again here in Amsterdam and other areas. We, it's like this big water boiler uh, that can, can serve as a battery also when the wind and the sun is, uh, is not out there. So e-boilers is, is, is an area we invested, and green gas, as you just discussed, apart from district heating, of course. Mm -hmm. So those would be the key areas we believe in most. And of course, we are exploring hydrogen. Uh, especially green hydrogen. Oh, you were hoping I was going to say that. No, no, oh. just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a hot topic. It me, is, so. and, and we are definitely part of the exploration there. It's, it, uh, the technology in itself is not the question. Uh, again, here is the, more the question, how scalable can we make it, how yes. affordable can we make it, and how adaptable, especially in industry. I believe this is something for the bigger companies. Mm -hmm. uh, when will it, when will, will it, will it reach a certain mass? But yeah. we are definitely part of that journey. So, uh, 2 billion euros in wind is quite a lot, and you recently opened a new uh, wind farm, offshore wind farm in the Netherlands, and it was said to be subsidy-free, declared the first subsidy-free wind farm. Um, that sounds very uh, sensational. I wonder, what does it mean for a wind farm to be subsidy-free? Well, it basically means that we don't require any subsidies from the government to sort of support all the risks we face because we just run it as a value uh, creating assets. So mm -hmm. we deal with all the risks of whilst building it and you know producing the electricity and getting the returns back on our investment, which basically means you say this is now a mature market uh, and it can stand on its own. Um, the world of building wind farms, by the way, has changed rapidly uh, throughout the years. I don't know if you were able to find it and how far your preparation went. But if you look at the UK, for example, it was really sad that I think in the last one or two tenders, nobody actually bid for mm -hmm. new wind farms. The similar challenge is going to be in Netherlands and, and Germany, perhaps, because the overall risk uh, and the cost levels of building a wind farm with the fluctuating energy prices and, and many, many factors like stuff you would think would be good, right? Because the, the, the windmills, they get bigger and taller than ever before, so they produce more uh, output. Mm -hmm. And you would say generally like, oh, that sounds good, right? But what happens is that these big windmill producers they can't earn their, their investments back anymore because yeah. by the time that their version is out, a newer version is already out, so you don't get your investments back. So you see the big Siemens and Gamesas struggle with this because the market is developing so rapidly. Um, so right now, I would say, yeah, the, that market is challenged. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our, our forecast or our belief is that that will fix itself in a way. Um, so definitely we will be there. So as you then mentioned also, Building a subsidy-free wind farm involves a lot more costs and risks than building one with subsidies. Um, money needs to come from somewhere. So are you also sure that this wind farm can remain subsidy-free indefinitely? Yeah, if you build a subsidy-free, you don't get subsidy when to go and get stuff. But That's management not how it works. is also expensive, right? Management? Management of the wind of farm. Of the wind farm. Oh, I thought management in general. Oh, no, yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> no, management. Yes, yes, of course. But, you know, you can't go back to the state and say, we need money now to support that state, that state uh, fund. Uh, so that's not how it works. So we have to deal with that. Uh, so can we still run that subsidy or, or uh, at a profitable level? That is our intention. But with the fluctuating energy prices, eh, you will see with every asset, one year it's more profitable than other years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what would motivate you to take such a risk then? Well, first of all, because we believe we have the excellent capability to build these uh, parks. Yeah? We've done it, we, we have a lot of experience, both in Sweden, but also in the UK, uh, to, to develop this. We believe it's our role. 
uh, mm -hmm. we believe wind is, plays an essential role. And not just because wind in itself is holy, but if we would have lived in Sweden with all the high mountains and the water, we would have used that natural resource, of course. We don't have that in the Netherlands. Uh, so the space is more limited, but we have the sea and we have the room for these wind um, wheels. And in the end, our, our commitment to becoming uh, CO2 emission free, uh, we have to deliver on it. And these are the best options, we believe, for now. Mm. So I think that from like this past few questions, it seems that you are really very close to already being um, close to net zero, close to being 100% renewable, but that's not really the case. Your uh, deadline for net zero is only 2040. And as you also mentioned before, you're only comparing to the year 2017 in most of your targets. Um, in comparison, Shell, a huge oil company, particularly infamous at this university, um, is said to be uh, net zero by 2050. Compared to this, do you think that you are being ambitious enough? Well, it feels we're ambitious enough because it's a lot of hard work. Uh, so I, don't, I definitely don't want to radiate that we're there yet because we're working with 40,000 colleagues on a daily basis really, really hard to deliver this uh, purpose in all the countries. And every country has its own challenges. You could argue Sweden perhaps the least because they're well, you know, it's already know. quite, it's quite green. Also there we of course see the B2B uh, business which isn't 100% defueled yet or defossiled yet. But look at Germany for example, eh? they're way behind us still. Um, you know, they just stepped away from, from oil heated houses into gas heated boilers. So um, I understand the criticism and the challenge is always welcome. We're doing, we're working as hard as we can. We're not there yet. It's not 2030 yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if we've delivered on this, uh, uh, on this journey towards 2030 and 2040, and in the meantime, don't forget that at least all the households and all the SME customers get this 100% fossil free electricity. Um, then I would say, yes, we should move faster because that's always the answer. But I also think that sometimes, you know, we can also be proud that of the stuff we already did. We built this windmill of this wind farm offshore, 18 kilometers from the shore with 139 turbines with huge waves. And, you know, that was unprecedented. So we're pretty proud if we're standing there and we see people who work there day and nights getting soaked in salty water. That is what we humans also built. And with the aspect then of ecology, yeah, which is sometimes forgotten, with the fact that we do that with the en entrepreneurs or the environmentalists from the North Sea, mm -hmm. and we study also the, you know, the flow of the, of the birds, because we also don't want to kill the birds, and if we study how sea uh, lions, they nest around the, the pillars, and if we see how seaweed grows, so we work with all the ecolo ecological aspects as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes hard not to be a little bit proud then. Maybe more modesty should be in place, but you know, I am a positive person, so it helps me to be proud and then work hard again to get to these goals. So you describe this transition as a great challenge. Uh, a lot of energy companies do, and it also makes sense that it would be. Um, since its founding, Vattenfall has been, you mentioned it, a little bit focused on hydro, for example, and in general on a lot of uh, electricity-based uh, source of energy, and that would um, make one assume that you have an advantage also adapting to renewable energy. Uh, do you think that this is the case? Is Vattenfall much better equipped also than other companies who make this transition? I don't know if we're better equipped. And the boring answer perhaps would be, I don't, I don't really mind. I hope I'm not better equipped. Competition-wise, that would be smart. But I hope that a lot of companies like us are well equipped because we're going to need every company to move in that direction. Right? So it's a bit a double because we are a commercial company, of course, I have to be profitable, but in the end, I'm very happy if I read that a competitor is also opening up a new e-boiler site or a solar park, park because there's enough cake for everyone, if you will. We, ha as a country and as a European world, have to move towards this, this ambition. I don't think we have to fight over who is best equipped. There's enough to do. I hope we all move fast enough. Mm. Yeah, But there must be a reason why other companies are finding it very difficult to focus more on re renewables. What do, you, what do you think is the main trade-off there? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Eh? Um, if, if you're working in a transition, you're dependent on, for example, politicians or the media. Um, and sometimes it's easier to not be on the forefront, to not have a, an ambition. Uh, uh, sometimes when, when building something new, you run the risk. You have to be willing to take the risk, as you've already described. So it's not always easier. Perhaps it's easier to sort of run with the demand of today. There's still a lot of households out there very willing to buy a new gas-heated boiler. It just costs you 2,500 euros, you know? Why not? Uh, a heat pump costs you 10,000 euros. And it's a lot of stuff with subsidies and, you know, insulating your houses. 
So, you know, why bother? Just buy a new gas heated boiler and, you know, I'll follow the rest when uh, the time is ready. So, tom so sometimes it's, it's, it's easier to not have that ambition. When you have the ambition, you run into political discussions, regulator, huh? you can say we were caught greenwashing because we did something wrong, but we were also caught greenwashing, in your words, because we are at the forefront and we have this ambition, so you, m you don't make your life way easier by, ha by being on the forefront. Yeah, so As you can guess, we like being on the forefront and it's not, a, it's not too bad to have some headwind, yeah. but it's not always easy. Economics are uncertain, technological developments are uncertain, political climate is uncertain. Yeah, We yeah. like that, but... <laughs> In a recent interview, you used the closing, the 2019 closing of Butterfalls coal plant in the Netherlands to complement the company's efforts to become greener, exactly, being on the forefront. And the reason you did this is saying that uh, we closed our Dutch coal-fired power plant without any legal action. While, of course, quitting coal is great, is it something that signals real value that you had to do it without any legal action? No. But on the other hand, we could have chosen the similar route as competitors did. We could have gone to court and fight the government and say it is very unfair. We felt it was unfair because, you know, you, you get the license to build such a plant. You say, yes, I want to. OK, you get it. You build it. Then you have this economic value. Hundreds of people work there on a daily basis. And then all of a sudden, the, the rules of the game change. And the government says, for whatever reason, you know what? We're going to close early. We have to reach following the agenda uh, uh, verdict. We have to move faster. So we're now going to close all the coal-fired coal power plants. Okay, you know, but as a company who's invested in there, it's like, uh, okay, but you know, we had an agreement and uh, who's going to pay for the damages? And not just the revenue part, it's also the people working there who got laid off or had to be reassigned. So you just have to, in that sense, make an agreement. You can fight it, go to court, maybe you even win it or stall it like, like some of the big competitors did. But we said, you know, Let's take a different approach. Again, if you will, with the greenwashing a verdict. Let's look at it differently. Don't we also agree that these coal-fired power plants at one point in time should be closed? We do. We're Vattenfall. Okay, so then let's take a different approach. Let's see if we can have a reasonable agreement with the government and close it earlier. But that was an emotional journey for all the people who worked there because they were told all of a sudden, your job ends four years earlier. So you mentioned a lot of the social costs of also uh, this transition, closing coal plants. Uh, we've seen uh, plenty of protests surrounding that, also in Germany, for example. Uh, who do you think is responsible to deal with the social costs? Social costs as in the increasing energy prices, you mean, the energy um, bills? Well, you have layoffs, mass layoffs, for example, increasing energy prices. Yes, everything involved there. That's well, a good question. I think it's one of the questions that needs further discussion. Uh, right now, as you know, um, I'm, I'm on the customer side. As a CCO, you're very in, interacting with your customers. The sad part of the transition, it, it has a very unfair uh, trajectory. The people benefiting from having solar panels on the roof, getting a certain amount for that, they have the money to buy it, they have the house to put it on, and they then benefit from a lower energy bill. Right now, s certain uh, schemes and mechanisms, maybe you've read about it in the paper, they are paid, uh, actually, by people who don't have a house or own a house, don't have access to the rooftop, can't afford a solar panel, but they're paying, because of the subsidy scheme, paying extra for the neighbor who's actually benefiting from it. So the whole system and the whole mechanism to get the costs uh, uh, divided much more transparently and fairly, that's a big uh, challenge, I would say. Yeah. It's something that we worry about. It's something with, that we try to talk to the government about. I think a lot of people are willing, but again, you have to have a stable cabinet and a stable policy uh, scheme to get there. It's not that people are unwilling, but in every stage of transition or revolution, if you will, certain mechanisms that worked in the past need to change. Yeah. It's definitely something that Fotofall wants to further discuss because we think it's unfair that those with the least options will pay the highest price on the short term, and on the longer term, we all have to readjust. In uh, more progressive policy areas, for example in Amsterdam, there is a scheme for providing good contracts for renewable energy companies um, with a district heating system. You usually tend to charge the maximum price allowed by the municipality there. There was a recent article about it in Het Parool. Um, and we were really wondering, is this also like a reason for you to even go into renewables or to make sure that you provide 100% renewable to, um, to the small and medium-sized enterprises and individual customers? I'm not sure if you understand your question. 
Is the profit element that comes from subsidies something that pushes you ah. to make sure to be 100% renewable? N no, because we have uh, an ambition to become fossil free in a sustainable way, which also means in a financially healthy way, but subsidies for us are not the means to get there. That's not why we're here. We're here if the subsidy is needed, it's there to make the business case equal. And especially with the heat discussion, especially here in Amsterdam, of course, it's very important to say that we, are go we are monitored by the government on the profit a, heating, a district heating company makes. So it can't go above a certain level. So every, every time a price increases or whatever this, this discussion is going on right now, it's not that we create more profit from it because it's kept. We can't rise above that level. If support is needed or if prices increase, it's the result, unfortunately, also uh, what we saw with electricity and gas, we now see with heat, costs went up for uh, the, the, the production uh, of, the, of, the, of the heat going into the system. Uh, the gas connection, uh, there is a connection to the gas prices, should be lower than that, but it went up, so also there it went up. So it's very unfortunate. Also there, I think, the mechanism to determine that price should be changed. Mm. Uh, so there, we have to move. Uh, a certain way we think. For right now, the district heating prices are determined a year in advance for the whole year to come. How so should it be done then? Well, we saw that with electricity and gas. If the market is fluctuating like this, then you should be able to change the prices faster, both going up as well as going down. Because uh, right now, at, l at least last year, the, district heat or the people who were in the heating district uh, they actually paid much less than the people uh, who had a gas contract because the prices were a year old, if you get what I mean. And right now they caught up and now they're paying more, uh, not more, but more than they were expecting. But there's a delayed effect. So you would be in change in, ch in favor of a system where, for example, per hour or per two hours you would have prices? That, that would be very dynamic, but at least more, more frequent here that, res that resembles the dynamics of the market. Okay. We're, again, this is a... This is an old industry in that sense, right? We exist 100 years. 100 years ago, the, the world wasn't the same as it is right now. The big question is, with the war going on and scarcity going on, is this the new normal? Well, uh, push, polish my glass ball every day, I don't know. But it doesn't seem we're going back to the world we had before. And then st we are still working with mechanisms, subsidy schemes, and certain processes that were not designed for this phase. So I think, I, and, and I don't think I'm alone there, we need to reevaluate how we do certain things. Again, and that was the start of this conversation, to spread out the effects, both the positive and the negatives, more equally and more fairly. So you mentioned the war in Ukraine, uh, and of course, recently, uh, in the past few years, during the big energy crisis we experienced in Europe, uh, people's prices rose, and there's a lot of misery as a result. Um, with energy, uh, consumers justifiably tend to look mostly at the price tag and not perhaps at the makeup of their energy. Um, did you, as a company, experience that the energy crisis um, maybe also helped or hurt your effort to become greener? Well, I would say, first of all, definitely nobody called us to say, how green are you and, you know, uh, can I get a, I'm willing to pay more. Uh, so definitely everybody was into price, understandably, at these levels. That doesn't mean uh, that we changed our tactics or our strategy, so we didn't. So we still offered, for example, green gas mix products with the availability we have. We haven't stopped our 100% green uh, electricity sourcing. So this is part of our price, and that is what we didn't change to win the competitor's game. I would say it's the opposite right now. Uh, if we saw with the energy crisis that a lot of insecurity arose. At the, f at the start of the crisis, we saw some of our smaller competitors go bankrupt or step out, and then these customers were really hurt, right? Mm -hmm. They had to switch to another uh, a party, and then they got charged double because you know, you know it had to be sourced extra, et cetera. Uh, that was really painful. So I think in general, we saw a return for almost like the uh, um, like likeability of the bigger sized companies in the trust that they wouldn't fall over and that they could swallow the effects of the energy crisis. So in that sense, I don't think that hurt. Um, the fact that people were concerned about the price over the sustainability, fair enough. But then we also said, you know, we continue, we continue to care also about the sustainability part, but we also understand that your concern is now more about the prices and we, we, we will do whatever we can to get you through this with delayed payments, uh, with uh, solutions that would work for them, with extra help on, on, on becoming more uh, insulated in the houses, for example. So we did what we could. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, how will the general transition affect your profitability? Well, our ambition is to keep it stable, if you will. Uh, and that, of course, is a challenge because right now it's still much easier to earn a profit on selling gas uh, and fossil uh, electricity, maybe electricity perhaps not, but especially on gas and natural gas um, is both cheap for the customer and profitable for companies selling it. And sometimes with wind and solar, uh, with, the, with the difference in value, uh, both on the market level as well as with customers, that is much more vulnerable. So um, um, our ambition is to keep the profitability stable where possible grow. Um, but of course, the reality, let's, be, let's face it, there is a challenge that not every value pool is equally sized. So that's also one of the reasons we, we're stepping into different value pools, uh, not only for sustainability reasons, but also because we want to uh, develop other activities like uh, our e-mobility uh, 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 ventures, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is also where the specific character uh, Vattenfall becomes really interesting because you are state-owned by the Swedish state or Vattenfall Group is. So compared to other energy companies, uh, perhaps the profitability aspect is a little bit more, you have some more wiggle room there basically. You can, uh, is you this can, the case? You can ask me five different manners the same question, but the answer is still no. They run us as a private company with a profitability <laughs> target, a dividend request. But of course, I think when the, when, when the going gets tough, if, and if we would get into issues, so you know, in the energy crisis, it felt emotionally more mm -hmm. comfortable to be part of not a venture capitalist or whatever, um, and part of a, a, a company or a country that, that is very, very uh, designated to realize this ambition. But in practice, to be honest, we are run like every other privately owned company in the sense that we have to be financially sustainable and profitable as our CEO always says, you know, nobody benefits from a, uh, a bankrupt Vattenfall. Mm -hmm. Then we cannot build the wind farms anymore. Then we cannot uh, 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 turn down all our coal plants in Germany, for example, because someone has to pay for that. And it for sure is not never 100% society or the government. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe the audience has more formulations of the same questions. Oh, yeah, let's try the Swedish state one one more time. <laughs> um, can you go to uh, the girl with glasses, please? Thank you. Um, so I have a question about other forms of sustainable energy, because from what I know, saving on energy can be very beneficial. And I don't mean only the consumer side or like your customers, but also the process of getting the energy from the production side to the consumers can be very, can have high energy losses. So I was wondering if Vattenfall also works in that if there's a potential for you to like look into you know the tubes that <laughs> lead the energy or i don't actually know how it's done and then my second question is about energy cooperatives because i also read that that can be very um yeah a solution for the future actually to create a self-sufficient village or a neighborhood so i was wondering if that's also something you're looking into or if that completely goes beyond like yeah the scope of Vattenfall. thanks Thank you, and thank you for the first question. If, if my media department looks back, they're going to they're gonna say I really missed out on one point because I always start in every interview that the cheapest and cleanest energy is the energy you don't consume. So thank you. The <laughs> savings part is really important. I almost <laughs> forgot about it. No, but, but clear, clearly that's true. Uh, one of the other benefits, by the way, of the energy crisis, if we can call it like that, is that for the first time in the Netherlands, we saw consumption on, in households decrease with 30%. We've never seen that. No matter how high the prices went or low went, there was no correlation. And for the first time, it, people proved it to be true. And I don't mean the people with the sad stories that they say, you know, they're, they're shivering in their houses and don't eat warm food anymore. That's the separate category. But for a lot of households, they realized, you know, put, turning down the heating system to 19 degrees, like I did with my home with two small kids, you know, we don't freeze to death at 19 degrees. Sure, at first point, 21 degrees feels more comfortable, but 19 actually you get accustomed to. And then at night you get a blanket, snuggle up, and it was actually doable. And that really saved a lot. I, I had not expected that it would save that much, but to be fair, the prices were also that high, you know, it really mattered. Right now, we, can, we see that that consumption saving continues. Again, I had not expected it. I was a bit gloomy. I thought everybody goes back to their normal behavior. Right now, we hope that this trend continues and that it's still a reduction of 20% without any technological progress. The same goes for industries, because that was your comment as well. Eh? The same goes for making the whole system more efficient. 
if we look at the trend of energy consumption in the Netherlands, you could say that's already been going on. Because at the same time, while we were electrifying more, and we got electric cars, there was a lot more electrification going on, on average, you see the electricity consumption in the Netherlands stabilizing for several years right now. So that means, how is that possible? Because we were getting more efficient, also in our production processes. And, and final comment there would be, yes, we're very into that game. Uh, I know this video is going to be posted on YouTube. If you, whilst you're there, look up a very recent video I was watching yesterday about the plans for the, the fossil free energy hub we're going to build here at the Hemweg plant in, uh, in Amsterdam. There you can see a really nice video how this will work, how we will use the, the excess waste, uh, or the heat waste from the, from the gas fired power plant in, in time uh, fueled with hydrogen, how we use that excess waste to put in an electricity boiler in a battery on site, and how we will really close the loop and make it more efficient. Uh, and then that is definitely a game we want to be in. And I think your, your second question was about energy co cooperatives. Um, yeah, it's something we definitely keep an eye on. We have a, an, a, an, a, a startup. It's no longer a startup because it's been around for a while. It's called Power Peers. And that used to come from that thinking of you know, sharing electricity, sharing surplus solar production, uh, but also uh, um, supporting perhaps local cooperatives. We haven't seen it really bloom yet, but of course we will monitor it closely. I think in practice sometimes it's much more of a hassle than people consider it. Uh, of the administration, what do you do if the wind isn't there or the solar isn't there? And is this really your hobby? Because it's, it's, I can say it's quite hard work to have it as a professional hobby, to run it as a side hobby. Um, I think in general that, that's challenging, but for sure it will be part of the mix because the mix has to be very broad in order to get to all our ambition levels. Uh, we have time for one short audience question. Why? Let's uh, go here. Hey, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I was wondering what is uh, your company's exact relationship to nuclear energy and if you've looked uh, at the option of small modular reactors maybe because of also you are um, in the UK a lot and there is it there SMRs are really big topic so yeah yeah thank you yeah Fattenfall besides hydropower has a long history in nuclear power so in the in Sweden we run five big operational nuclear power plants um, small modular reactors is definitely something we're looking into we're not sure yet what the winning technology will be, how they will coexist, or if it's country dependent, perhaps. We plan to build two uh, small modular reactors at our Ringhal site uh, in, uh, in Sweden. She can tell you where it is. And um, um, so we're exploring it. We haven't made up our mind yet what our future is. We're going to learn from it in Sweden and then decide whether or not we should either bring it to UK, potentially Netherlands, because the appetite seems to be changing here. But for now, our, my media answer would be we have no concrete plans for that in other countries than Sweden. But we're definitely looking... By, by the way, small always sounds very uh, seductive, right? Because small media, modular reactors are like the size of our Borsele plant here in the Netherlands. So <laughs> it depends on what you call small. Um, thanks for those questions. And you also anticipated we wanted to take the interview next, which is nuclear power. Oh, I thought we were done. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> So we were wondering, and you mentioned it, that Vattenfall has been involved in nuclear energy for quite a long time. Uh, recently, there was a case of uh, the Swedish CEO saying that uh, we're going to yeah, go drop our 100% renewable goal and go to net zero, and that that also involves the nuclear change, so to speak. Um, of course, we see this a lot in politics. This seems like companies also responding to a more open atmosphere to nuclear. So would you say that in this case, um, Vattenfall's move into nuclear was more of a response to the markets or politics? Or are those two... In the past? Yes. I don't know. I wasn't there mm -hmm. many, many years ago when we decided to move into nuclear. I think with nuclear, uh, but perhaps also with biomass, I haven't touched upon it yet, uh, but, you know, it really... It's more sensitive in a way uh, in certain countries, polit politically, but also the societal acceptance. Um, so I don't, I don't know why it was at that point in time it was accepted. Like in France, you know, the people were much less against it uh, than we were in other countries. And that heritage you bring with you 
with future topics. So for a long time, we said in the Netherlands, as Vattenfall, even of th though our track record in Sweden is, of course, very strong, we said it's not an option even to bring it to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I, we do believe, however, that nuclear has a role to play uh, in the sustainability challenge we face as, as a world. If that means it should be on Dutch soil or not, and if we have to be the ones building it, we're far away from that conversation. Mm. We're right now having the conversation with the Swedish government on the Swedish plans and, and uh, future uh, developments. But in most cases, uh, nuclear energy tends to be um, seen as a net, like winning in the net zero game, sorry, in the zero sum game um, when it comes to investing towards renewables and, uh, or just investing into non-fossils. There seems to be a push by most pro-nuclear people that they should be uh, done instead of renewables. Do you recognize this? No, not necessarily, because I'm, I'm, you know, there are a lot of people pushing every direction. So if you read the paper or if you look at, at books or whatever, if one expert says, you know, wind uh, energy is the way to go, there are five who stand up and say it's not the way to go. If uh, electric cars are good, no, they're not. So also here with nuclear, there are opposing views. Let's agree on that. Should it come at the cost of wind and solar and others? I don't think so. I think it really depends on sort of the natural environment of the country you're in and the area you're in, what is the best option for you. In general, I can say that Netherlands is much less equipped for the large-scale solutions on nuclear that Sw than Sweden is for the, sh the simple reason of uh, the property or the, 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 the vacant areas you could build it. So, you know, it's also the sort of the natural situation of, of the country, the resources you have to make the best of that. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, we have a very equipped gas pipe system behind, b beneath our feet. It's very logical that we find alternatives to put through this, those pipes than natural gas. Economically, that makes more sense, right? Maybe even feasibly, it makes more sense. We can, you can, can then faster adopt and use it. We have the North Sea, we have wind. Let's use that. Let's not dream of hydropower because we first have to start building mountains. Similar question with nuclear. If the question even comes up, it, there will be limited space. Mm. So you mentioned structural uh, really conditions for having certain types of energy. And one thing that's been uh, quite talked about recently is that the electrical grids are just not really equipped for the transition to renewable energy and even nuclear energy. Um, do you think that uh, when we talk about such infrastructure then, uh, should it be primarily a private or a public venture to build them? To be honest, I don't really care if it's privately or publicly owned, we need to invest. Mm -hmm. But it's, again, it's a combination. It's like uh, one of your colleagues here said, it's also a matter, we have to adjust our behavior. We have to adjust the way we use energy, when we use it, what we use it for. Um, because why do we all have to charge, not all, but those who have an electric car, why do you have to plug it in between four and eight? Well, because you arrive at home, plug it in, it's easy, you don't have to worry about it anymore. But there are apps in your car that you can actually charge it at the most beneficial moment. I don't mind if it starts charging at one o'clock at night when I'm in bed. But, but we are very reluctant as human beings to change our behavior because we're so used to it just being there. It always works, right, the light? It works, the heating system. Not if you're in, in America, for example, you were used to way different things, but here we are used, oh, there a glitch, uh, or was it a photo? But um, no, a glitch. A glitch, huh? yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's the god of the grid. <laughs> yeah. No, but we're used to the fact that it works, um, but it will no longer work if you start electrifying further with all the new additions coming in. But it's, again, it's an N, N, N. Mm. We need to invest. Who does it? I don't mind. I think there's a good cooperation between government and the grid companies, are we too late? Easy to say, sure, we are too late in hindsight, but when it was proposed and the grid companies, uh, I wanna say a plus for them, they did bring the topic up, then you have to find someone who says, yes, let's invest. Then the grid fees would have gone up five, four or five years ago, who was willing to pay for it because we couldn't foresee the situation. Sometimes in an energy revolution or in any revolution at all, it always feels like you're too late, but we're only willing to adjust when you know there's more urgency. When it starts hurting a bit. It's when it starts hurting a bit. Is that philosophically or theoretically a bit dumb, maybe? <laughs> but you know, I've been there, I've watched it, I, I sympathize for how it went, but we should have done it way earlier, that's true. But again, and I agree with your colleague there, often the story of using it differently, saving it differently, st storage options, you know, which would become much more 
uh, attractive if the subsidy scheme for solar production, for example, weren't there. We need to do work smarter. Yeah, and one thing that's connected with the grid is also that it allows for more people having their own energy sources at home, for example, having more solar panels. How is Vattafall preparing for a future where there is more decentralized energy sourcing going on? Well, we're very happy for people to have solar panels to the rooftops, but you know, in that sense for us, maybe fortunately the, so the sun doesn't always shine. So you still need a backup system uh, for when, you know, in winter times and even with batteries, you know, normal batteries in a household, our predictions still are, I think general predictions are that, is, that still you then need a backup or a backup supplier. Uh, but in general, of course, very happy if people start producing uh, more decentral and uh, renewable energy. I think the only comment, but that goes too far for today, don't put it back in the grid when we don't need it. That's what's the problem. So we need to store it or use it and don't overproduce. Don't become a local producer because you disrupt the current system. So either we change the system or we don't put it back in the system, but it doesn't work right now. Mm -hmm. okay. So today we have been talking a lot about your future plans and your general ideas about the energy transition. What's the one thing that you are most proud about when talking about Vattenfall's greening efforts? I think in general, that 40,000 employees in Europe, being Swedish or Dutch or English or German, you should come to one of our uh, employee meetings. You know, we have a lot of differences. You know, we people like, you know, we think that German people are sometimes really strange and even Swedes, I think, are sometimes really strange. <laughs> no offense taken. No offense taken. You think me, you know, I'm just too loud in general being Dutch, uh, I know. No, but if, if there's one thing that unites us and gives us energy is we really are motivated. I'm not the only crazy person on here on stage. We're really motivated to drive this mission. It's pretty cool to work at a company where a CEO will, will talk at the United Nations and at Davos and says, we as Falconfall will commit to this purpose and we will go there and we will build wind farms and we will take out our coal plants not because someone is protesting at our doorstep or not because we have to, but because we think we can and we have to as a company. Um, it's pretty cool to work with. So I, th I would say I'm most proud that we're at least we're trying the best we can. Mm -hmm. You can have an opinion about if it should, we should do it better, but it's really great to find that energy around you and, and everybody's so motivated. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to the audience also for tuning in today. If you want to, Tune in tomorrow for an interview about uh, the EU. We will have the expert Simon Hicks here from 1 to 2 p.m. Also to mention, if you're interested in doing what Saskia and I do, we have our applications open. They close on March 17th. Um, thanks so much, Cindy, for coming. Uh, let's please have a big round of applause. <laughs>